10 seconds. May I start? Yes, you can start now. Yep. Mm -hmm. Tesh Dile to all, and welcome to the first virtual event of the Freedom R, an online discussion hosted by the Asia Freedom Institute. I'm Sakina Butt, the moderator for today's panel. It is an absolute honor and privilege to share the screen with renowned and highly accomplished personalities. The central theme to be discussed for today's panel is human rights in China under Xi Jinping. In light of the upcoming 20th National Congress of the Chinese Communist Party to be held this October, let us weigh in the views and thoughts of our distinguished speakers. To speak on this topic, we have uh, four prominent speakers, Dokun Isa, President of the World Uyghur Congress, uh, Dr. Eva Pils, Professor of Law at King's College London, uh, Finn Lau, Founder of Hong Kong Liberty and Stand with Hong Kong, and Dr. Lufsang Singila, uh, the former Sikyong of the Central Tibetan Administration. A very warm welcome to all our speakers and also to our audience tuning in live from across the world. I would uh, like to, um, I would first like to introduce um, the founder or the president of Asia Freedom Institute, Kedar Okotsang. Um, he has previously served at, at the Central Tibetan Administration in various positions, including North America representative of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, and also the special advisor to Sikyong of Central Tibetan Administration. Kedola, Kedola will make uh, some opening remarks. Over to you, Kedola. Uh, thank you, Sakina. Good day to all the participants and everyone joining us online. Uh, I'd like to begin by saying how delighted I am uh, to see the Asia Freedom Institute uh, hosting its first event under the Freedom Hour program. So in the weeks and months ahead, we plan to convene uh, many more online events where we can invite uh, a diverse group of uh, people, experts, activists, uh, a journalist uh, and uh, religious and spiritual figures to really have a conversation around democracy, human rights and religious freedom uh, in China so that we can create more awareness and, uh, and greater understanding. You know, there is a Tibetan uh, saying, uh, small stove, hot fire. Uh, so that's really what uh, the Asia Freedom Institute aspires to become, uh, a small organization with uh, a big uh, dream uh, and punching above its weight. Um, you know, I mean, if you close your eyes and listen to whether it's a Uyghur, a Tibetan, or a Mongolian, a Hong Kong person, or even someone from the Chinese democracy community, if you just close your eyes and, and listen to their stories and narrative, it's also similar because I think we, we are all in this uh, together and fighting the same fight. Uh, all, you know, advocating for more rights and freedom from the Chinese government and working towards a more free and open China. So a core objective of the Asia Freedom Institute is to really facilitate this uh, community building and collaboration amongst uh, organizations and communities advocating for more rights and freedom from the Chinese government. You know, in the larger ongoing conflict uh, between democracy on the one, hand, one, one end and uh, authoritarianism on the other, it's really important that the communities associated with the Asia Freedom Community, uh, Freedom Institute, that we actually uh, have our voices heard and that we have a seat around the table because uh, these communities represent people who have directly experienced and survived uh, the aggression of the Chinese government. And its people today live in one of the most uh, repressive regimes and systems in the world. Uh, so it's very important that you know, we uh, work towards this common objective uh, in a united and collab collaborative way because uh, you know, the whole is much uh, greater than the sum of our parts. And, uh, and also we have to remember that uh, the Chinese Communist Party and the PRC is, is a powerful adversary for any one community or organization to confront alone. So again, I want to thank uh, today's speakers and the moderator uh, for this uh, uh, session on uh, human rights in China under Xi Jinping. It's such a timely topic because in little over a month on October 16th, the CCP will be convening its uh, 20th party Congress where the Congress is expected to rubber stamp an unprecedented uh, third term for Xi Jinping. 
So what really is the state of human rights in China today? And what can we expect in a possible Xi Jinping third term? So these are really some of the, the issues that I look forward to uh, hearing more of from our speakers today. And before I hand it over, I just want to quickly uh, just uh, touch on a few key things related to human rights in China today, especially in the context of uh, the Chinese government policies towards the non-Chinese communities, you know, quote unquote, the minorities. So there are three really quick things that I'll just uh, quickly uh, run through. One is uh, assimilation. Uh, the second is uh, controlling the next generation. And the third is the Chinese government's use of uh, technology as a tool of repression, right? So in terms of uh, assimilation, uh, it's, it's so clear now that the Chinese government has made this very hard pivot from kind of this token policy of accommodating and kind of, uh, uh, kind of an affirmative action-like policy towards the non-Chinese population to really now full assimilation. So as a result, the religion, uh, the language, the cultural identity of the non-Chinese uh, uh, population uh, is being systematically eroded today. Uh, so that's really well documented, and I'm sure our speakers will will uh, address that in, in greater depth. The second is, you know, after following uh, a hybrid policy of uh, harsh crackdown and also uh, undertaking infrastructure and just overall development policy, the Chinese leadership now has realized that. Uh, the kind of stability it seeks in um, East Turkestan, in, in Tibet and other areas, uh, they haven't really achieved that. So now I think what they are doing is they're really focusing on the next generation of, of, the, uh, you know, of the community. And thus, I think a very disturbing manifestation of that is uh, I think happening in, uh, in Tibet, for instance, where Today, three out of you know, every four children in the ages of uh, six to 18 are being shipped away you know, to these colonial boarding school-like uh, setup, away from their parents, away from their tradition, away from their language, away from their, you know, uh, their identity as Tibetans. And I think the, the end goal here really is to raise this younger generation. I'm sure something similar is also happening in East Turkestan as well so that these younger generation of Tibetans and Uyghurs grow up as very obedient you know, Chinese citizens and as potential CCP members. So that's really happening. And then in terms of uh, China's use of technology, I don't need to dwell on it so much because it's well documented. And again, I think uh, uh, a recent uh, case of this, which has just uh, come to uh, everyone's attention is the recent report by Human Rights Watch, where in Tibet now, there is this mass DNA collection happening where blood samples from Tibetans, you know, from people as young as uh, five year old is being taken without their consent. And uh, this is all part of the DNA profiling that's going on. And I think it's just, it represents yet another level of repression and control by the Chinese government over the Tibetans and Uyghurs and other non-Chinese uh, population uh, in, in, in China. So finally, what I want to say is uh, there's obviously so much to talk about, but just to end on a positive note, I really feel that uh, change in China will come from within. And, uh, you know, I think a lot depends on the economy. And uh, as we all know, the Chinese economy is right now experiencing some major challenges. So I think the years and years of uh, almost 10% GDP growth is now uh, a thing of the past. And uh, I bring up the economy because I think the, the longevity of the CCP is closely linked to this because uh, the Chinese government has convinced a vast majority of the Chinese uh, population that, uh, that they should trade in their rights and freedom, you know, uh, uh, in, in, uh, in lieu of, you know, greater, I guess, uh, economic prosperity and economic development. So I think we really have to watch uh, how the economy unfolds in the next uh, uh, several months and, and uh, upcoming years. And another critical area is demographics. Uh, so many experts have said that uh, the Chinese population has peaked and there's also now studies out there conducted by the Chinese government agencies themselves, which states that China's population will be half of what it is in, in the next 75 years. 
And I think finally, climate change, right? I think that's going to be a major disruptor in terms of both uh, the economy and uh, China's social stability. So on that note, uh, I just want to hand it back over to Sakina. And again, thank you so much to all the speakers and to the moderator and, uh, and to the viewers. Yeah, so over to you, Sakina. Uh, thank you very much, Kedola, for introducing AFI and also giving a general remark on China, uh, which serves as an important conceptual framework for today's discussion. And before I proceed with the discussion, I would like to request all our speakers to please limit your uh, opening remark to five minutes so that we can have some time for, um, uh, for the questions and follow-up discussions. So... Um, our first speaker is uh, Dalkin Isa. Uh, let me do the honors of giving a brief introduction to him. Uh, Dokun Isa is an Uyghur politician and activist from East Turkestan. He is the president of World Uyghur Congress. Um, he has spoken on behalf of the rights of the Uyghurs and has also presented Uyghur Uyghur human rights issues to the UN Human Rights Council, uh, European Parliament, European, European governments, and international human rights organization. Over to you, Dolkin. Oh, okay. yeah. Hi, do you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we can hear you, Dolkin. Uh, yes. Thank you. Uh, very nice introduction, Sakina. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first, I would like to thank uh, Asia Freedom Institute for inviting me to speak uh, this important uh, first event. Alongside such a distinguished uh, speakers and uh, uh, friends, my good friends, Lobsang, uh, yeah, and also Kelsan. It is very encouraging to see Tibetan and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Uyghurs and some others and Hong Kongers and other uh, experts to uh, collective address the human rights uh, catastrophe in, in China. The horrific uh, persecution of all us, uh, all community and Xi Jinping's rule has brought us together. We must be united in the solidarity and the cooperate and collective address this horrific situation that affects us of all. Indeed, the human rights in China, particularly in Turkestan, uh, for the Uyghur people has been worsening over the past decades. But it was not until Xi Jinping assumed power that we have seen the human rights violation deteriorate to scale and the severity unseen in the 21st century. And Xi Jinping, the discrimination that Uyghurs have faced for decades has been transformed into the policy that aim to eradicate the Uyghur people as a, as a people. And the dangers their continual extends as a people with their distinct ethnic, cultural, and religious identity. Everything unique uh, of the Uyghurs, and the, as I said, the religious, cultural, language, everything is a target uh, today. Over the past four years, Five or four, four or five years, we have seen how Chinese government arbitrarily detained millions of Uyghurs in the concentration camp and has subjected them to the forced labor, torture, sexual and gender based violence, violence and the breast prevention measure, family separation, and the other form of the gravest human rights violation. To Xi Jinping, the Uyghur as a people with their own ethnicity, religion, language, social and cultural norm is threatened to his uh, autocratic rules. And the understanding of the Uyghur crisis similarly repose and, and understanding uh, of the whole Xi Jinping view for the future China and his repressive regime based on what we are saying in Turkestan, one must come to conclusion that there is a simple no place for the Uyghur people in Xi Jinping's China. Of course, the atrocity have not gone unnoticed by the international community, by now the United States government and the plus 10 parliament bodies worldwide recognize the Chinese uh, atrocity action against Uyghur people among crime against humanity and the genocide. This was also affirmed by the Uyghur tribunal, Uyghur tribunal within 
uh, 18 months collected 100,000 page document and more than 500 people testimony and uh, uh, last uh, the December 9th, last year, 2021, uh, we will tribunal a judgment Chinese government atrocity against is genocide crime against the humanity. Uh, yeah, the most recent confirmation uh, of this claim has come uh, from the United Nations just uh, last week. Uh, just last week, the United Nations Office of the High Commissioner for the Human Rights finally published its long overdue report on the situation of East Turkestan. The report confirmed what Uyghur community uh, and it is alias have been saying for the past year about scale and the severity of the Chinese, China's human rights atrocity. Uh, but no, this allegation finally bear stamp of the United Nations. And yesterday, uh, also more than 25 uh, UN experts, special reporter, uh, and the call, the Chinese government called United Nations to take concrete action and uh, uh, urgent uh, section in the Human Rights Council uh, and appointed special uh, mandate and special reporter to investigate the situation. This is a good, uh, good step, of course. Uh, but it is just a, a, a condemning uh, or just a, a issues, a, a, a empty promise uh, will not change anything. Uh, I will continue by saying this is just the beginning of the road towards justice and accountability. No world has been made aware of the atrocity crime happening in Turkestan, Tibet, and Southern Mongolia, and Hong Kong, and Taiwan. So it can no longer close its eyes. I hope the further discussion, discuss of the Pacific recommendation and the during this event. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dolkin, for mentioning the uh, recently released and much talked about report of this time in the opening discussion. I'm glad that the UN High Commissioner released the report at least 13 minutes prior to um, her resignation, even though she should have done it long time ago. Anyways, um, we shall delve uh, more into this later, Dolkin. Now, moving on to our next speaker, I'm uh, delighted to introduce you to um, uh, Finn Lau. Uh, Finn Lau is an advocate in exile and one of the 2019 Hong Kong movement leaders. He is the founder of Hong Kong Liberty. Uh, Finn was detained under inhuman conditions in Hong Kong and was beaten to near death by Chinese Communist Party's agents in London in 2020. He underpinned key strategies like Finnicism for the Hong Kong movement and launched global initiatives for over 50 cities throughout 2019 to 2022 addressing Hong Kong and China democracy and human rights issues. Over to you, Finn. Thank you. So may I ask each of the attendees or audience, what's the price that you are willing to pay for defending democracy and freedom? To me, death is the price that I'm willing to pay and almost put it paid for in 2020. So I'm Vin Lau, a Hong Kong activist, uh, officially wounded by the Hong Kong invasion authorities and one of the 10,000 arrestees of the 2019 Hong Kong movement. In 2020, I was detained in Hong Kong under inhumane condition for over 50 hours and was later beaten to near death in London near my house by some CCP agents. Without six hours of urgent medical treatment, I might not be able to survive and continue to speak to fight here today. Year 2022 is an iconic yet ironic year to Hong Kongers since the 1st of July marked the 25th anniversary of the 1997 Hong Kong handover. Hong Kong was guaranteed with at least 50 years of autonomy, civil liberties, and rule of law under the Sino-British Joint Declaration, which is an international agreement that was registered at the UN. However, even before reaching the 25th anniversary milestone, the international treaty has been severely breached by China, while Hong Kong civil society, rule of law, and autonomy have been crushed by the Chinese Communist Party. In 2021, more than 50 civil society organizations were forced to disband or leave Hong Kong, including Amnesty International, which used to use Hong Kong as their regional headquarters. There were more than one, uh, 10,000 political arrests and more than 1,000 political prisoners in the city. All the prominent pro-democracy political figures are either imprisoned, prosecuted, or in exile. 
of those sentenced to prison, the total length of their imprisonment is almost 800 years. In 2019, millions of Hong Kongers marched in the streets in a leaderless pro-democracy movement. Peaceful and progressive filing tactics were employed interchangeably to resist Beijing's brutal suppression. However, exploiting the window of opportunity brought forth by the COVID pandemic, Beijing bypassed Hong Kong Legislative Council to enact the Jacolian National Security Law, NSL. Since then, hundreds of Hong Kongers have been arrested under the NSL, while several Hong Kong activists, including myself, became wounded on a global warrant issued by the Chinese Communist Party. The Hong Kong courts, under immense pressure from Beijing, have explicitly ruled that the principle of presumption of innocence is inapplicable under the NSL. The regime's action to freeze Apple Daily's assets has further proven that protection of private property rights is gone in Hong Kong. Meanwhile, press freedom has collapsed as journalists' investigations could be conflictable. Within seven months, Hong Kong has lost the top three independent news media outlets and mass media, including Apple Daily, Stan News, and Citizen Press. In 2021, the Heritage Foundation made an insightful decision of dropping Hong Kong from its index of economic freedom, with an accurate remark that said, those policies in Hong Kong are ultimately controlled from Beijing. Whilst Hong Kong no longer qualifies as an international financial center, Hong Kongers are ready to take the heat of economic sanction as a leverage against the Beijing regime. That is the will and determination of Hong Kongers as reflected by the large scale public survey finished right before the promulgation of the NSL in May, 2020. Beijing is clearly gambling over the Hong Kong issues and challenging the free world that we would take no concrete actions except issuing joint statements. At the 25th anniversary of Hong Kong handover, at this vital moment, at this ironic milestone, it is time for democratic countries to act. There's no better timing for democratic countries like France and Czechia to suspend the extradition treaty with China and Hong Kong, as well as to impose sanctions on Hong Kong and Chinese officials, thereby proving Beijing wrong in its overconfident assertions. The extradition treaties with China and Hong Kong are nice hanging above our heads. I could be directly extradited to Hong Kong and China for giving my testimonial at any parliaments or, or international conferences. Yet, some risks have to be taken because this is the right thing to do, to break the status quo and change for a better future. I call myself a paranoid dreamer. I understand one of the hurdles that make the free world a bit hesitant to, to the concrete action to safeguard dignity, justice, and human rights is the country's growing dependency on the Chinese market. The war in Ukraine has proven the heavy cost of building reliance, heavy reliance on totalitarian regimes like Russia and China. As such, to untie our hands in the fight against autocracy, we must reduce our over-dependency on the Chinese market and stop the infiltration by the CCP into our vibrant civil society and decision-making bodies. We will strategically reclaim liberty and democracy bit by bit and brick by brick. History told us ceding concession to autocracy would only lead to further concession until there's nothing left. We should act now to stop another tyranny in Beijing from rising again and dominating the world. My fellow Hong Kongers, Tibetan and Uyghur friends and I will continue to fight and resist and help overturn the tide until the free world join us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Finn. Uh, and so sorry to know that you had to go through a lot of physical abuse under CCP. And uh, I must say that in one of the interviews that, that I've heard is that uh, you told um, that you had gone through a lot of physical abuse that you no longer fear death. You no longer fear death. And uh, I think that is one of the most uh, strongest and the bravest statements made by an activist for his fight for democracy. So thank you so much, Finn. And uh, moving on to our next speaker, uh, we have the man who actually needs no introduction, but still let me do the honors of introducing him again. Uh, Dr. Lufsang Singela served as the Sikyong of the Central Tibetan Administration from 2011 to 2021. Uh, Dr. Singe received a Master's of Law degree and a Doctor of Judicial Science degree from the Harvard Law School. He is an expert on Tibet, China, and international human rights law and has given lectures around the world and has been consulted by numerous media outlets. Over to you, uh, Dr. Lufsang Singela. 
Oh, thank you, Sakinala. So good to see you um, uh, online. You. Uh, uh, I'm uh, privileged to be here uh, at the you know, online event on human rights in China and Xi Jinping, organized by Asia Freedom Institute and uh, my friend Kedola and you know uh, Donze um, uh, and Tinsi Deche, all you know behind the scene organizing this thing. First, um, I want to you know say so good to see you, my friend Dolkun. You know, uh, we've been together for many years now. You know, so we are uh, solidarity in arms, and each time I hear about how your parents suffer, you know, how, you know about especially about their death and not knowing and knowing about their death through newspapers, news media, and all your siblings, you know, and uh, suffering always pains me. And then obviously our solidarity goes to all the uh, good brothers and sisters who are suffering in, you know, East Turkestan now. Um, and then I'm uh, so glad to, to have, uh, you know, Finn Lau. Again, we had an event uh, last time. Uh, I mistook his identity, but you know, good to see you on a bigger screen. So you know, now I uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, get to hear you uh, more clearly. And my solidarity again uh, goes to you because you also again uh, suffer so much, you know. Uh, so you know, we all are the victims of you know, human rights violation uh, perpetrated by the Chinese government. So we are not talking about human rights in theory. Um, but in reality, I just lunch with another Hong Kong um, leader, uh, Dennis Koch, you know, recently. And then when you hear uh, personal stories like that, uh, it always pains you. Uh, at the same time, it emboldens you. It gives you the courage to say that, you know, yes, we must write this, you know, um, journey together. It will be difficult. You know, uh, there will be obstacles. There will be intimidation. There will be all kinds of, you know, um, direct and indirect threat uh, to all of us, but we must persevere. This is how, you know, we uh, prevail. And then, you know, I, oh, in the last 10 years as Sikyong, and I, even I uh, continue to say this, and today we have uh, ever you know, as an expert on, you know, human rights uh, and, 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 and about uh, China. So she will give the expert, you know, uh, conclusion, the most difficult job, uh, 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 of our, you know, uh, uh, statements, but I have always been saying this, you know, um, that when we talk about human rights violations of Tibetans or Hong Kongers or Uyghurs, we are no more talking about us alone. We are just giving example to the rest of the world, because the tentacles of Beijing government is everywhere. It's in your boardroom. It's in your government. It's in your, you know, uh, businesses. You know, it's in your uh, intellectuals everywhere. Uh, for example, when you know, for example, we always say Tibet uh, is the patient zero. Now uh, we have suffered a lot. Uh, the party secretary of Tibet Autonomous Region was sent to Xinjiang, and who perpetrated all this crime against humanity, which even you know, UN Human Rights Commissioner uh, uh, Commissioner has come out with a report now affirming. Uh, that yes, crime against humanity did take place um, and continue to take place in Xinjiang and also uh, with the uh, people in uh, Hong Kong. And often they used to say, okay, this is an isolated case, Tibetan case, it will not happen to the rest of uh, you know, uh, China. But then our brothers and sisters, you know, the uh, Uyghur brothers and sisters case came out, it opened their eyes. Now with Hong Kong, uh, you know, uh, the Dokun and we were together uh, in a panel where the Hong Kong activists and especially your former uh, uh, Emily Lau was given the John McCain uh, Leadership Award. Remember, Dokun, I said that at that time, in November of 2019, I said very soon uh, China will impose repressive rules in Hong Kong and take over. And Emily Lau challenged me, said, no, we are not going to let it happen. People of Hong Kong will come out of the streets and we will continue to fight and it will not happen. And they, even she is specifically asked me, I said by December of 2019, but soon, six months later, by June of 2020, it did take place. And like, you know, Finn Lau, like you said, at that time I said, right, Dolkun? I said, look, what is the rest of the world going to do about Hong Kong? The situation is going to be worse just by issuing statements, passing laws, you know, and showing solidarity will, won't be enough. And then 
Uh, unfortunately, it happened that we are now, all our Hong Kong brothers and sisters are in exile, right? So what happened to us is happening to the rest of the world. Now, with the case of Xinjiang, our brothers and sisters in Hong Kong, many of the members of parliament in Europe and America spoke out against uh, you know, human rights violations. What happened to them? Now, the Chinese government has the audacity to ban you know, members of Congress of US, members of Congress of you know, uh, Canada, and member of parliament of Europe. So what happened to us is happening to the rest of the world. When Beijing can ban members of parliament, including the speaker of the US Congress, Nancy Pelosi, you can, might, you can imagine what they could do and doing to the rest of the world in developing countries who are dependent for foreign aid uh, from China. So yes, in Tibet, you know, uh, freedom of speech is violated. Freedom of association, assembly are violated. Intellectuals are put behind bars. Now, Chinese intellectuals are put behind bars. Chinese human rights activists are put behind bars, right? Now they are coming out and threatening the rest of the world, like in Denmark, uh, Norway, uh, Australia, you know? So our issue is no more an issue of simply Tibetans and Hong Kongers and Uyghurs or Mongolian or even Taiwanese, but rather it is a global issue. To have a government who says, I want to change the definition of human rights. I'm sure Eva is going to elaborate on that. We are going to control and influence United Nations. You know, three of the 15 UN agencies are controlled by Chinese government officials. And of the remaining 40, of the remaining uh, 12, right? The deputy uh, directors or the secretaries are Chinese. You know, so many of the UN agencies, right? WHO is under pressure, right? So, you know, you see the tentacles of Beijing government is everywhere. So, you know, I want to end by saying silence is complicit. When we talk about Tibetan human rights violation, Uyghur's human rights violation, Hong Kong's human rights violation, please don't remain silent because you are complicit with the repressive regime of Beijing. What happened to us is happening to your country, to your people as well. So collectively, like we coming together in solidarity today, we the whole world to join for the sake of democracy, for the sake of human rights of everybody. So with that, I want to end and uh, thank my you know, friends um, uh, in the same panel uh, and looking forward to meeting you in person and so one day soon, uh, you know, uh, uh, conference like this in person where a lot of people will come and go and show, uh, show the, the genuine support. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lopsang Singila. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lopsang Singela. And I totally agree with you that the Chinese issue is not just uh, our issue, but it's a global issue. Okay, so uh, moving on to our final speaker, Dr. Eva Pills. Uh, Dr. Eva Pills is a professor of law at King's College London and an affiliated scholar at the US Law, US Asia Law Institute of New York University Law School. She holds a PhD in law from University College London. At King's, she teaches courses on human rights law and so Society in China and authoritarianism, populism, and the law. Uh, before joining King's in 2014, Eva was an associate professor at the Chinese University of Hong Kong Faculty of Law. Uh, Dr. Pills, the screen is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much for uh, very kindly including me uh, uh, in this panel. Uh, I would like to just um, make a, a, a few uh, brief remarks that um, contextualize and to some extent, um, as I was invited to do, respond to uh, the comments by the previous speakers on this panel, um, uh, who have spoken with great authenticity to the specific human rights um, uh, violations uh, and the suffering encountered by the communities um, they, um, they particularly engage with. Um, uh, and who have also, and perhaps uh, especially Dr. Lopsang Sangay has done so, um, pointed, drawn our attention to the fact that um, uh, the issue, the question of how the Chinese party state uh, engages with human rights is no longer an issue that is uh, limited to China, but really concerns the world. So 
I think that um, in order to understand that um, the evolution of attitudes and the situation we are now in uh, with regard to human rights under Xi Jinping, uh, I think it is important firstly to uh, realize that the deterioration of the human rights situation that has so terribly affected the communities of Uyghurs and um, uh, uh, Tibetans and uh, also affected Hong Kong. And that deterioration has played out very much also across the whole of China, even though the effects have been somewhat different. Um, I think that um, we can broadly see the um, developments uh, under Xi Jinping as a kind of neo-totalitarian turn, really away from the ideas of reform, of rule of law improvements, of very gradual recognition of um, human rights um, that characterized the previous decades. Under Xi Jinping, um, not only has discourse changed very much away from um, at least giving sort of lip service to the recognition of universal human rights um, and towards a very relativistic um, discourse, um, not only in terms of uh, legislation that has really tightened control of uh, the party over uh, the whole of the government, but also society, but also in terms of um, widening repression. Repression that, um, and, and this to me has uh, always been an issue of special concern, has very much affected um, the already embattled uh, groups of human rights advocates, of legal advocates, of journalists, of academics, um, really the whole of civil society in China has suffered uh, from increased repression uh, under Xi Jinping and some of the practices that we see um, playing out, um, for instance, in the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region in Tibet, um, uh, uh, the, the forced disappearance, the systematic use of torture, etc., are of course also practices that affect the whole of Chinese society. So I think it's really important to see that deterioration as, um, uh, as, as sort of the, 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 the backdrop against which um, we've seen the unfolding of um, uh, unprecedented um, uh, levels of state crime. Uh, in um, these other regions. Um, the second point that I would like to very quickly make, and that comes back to sort of this question of how uh, deterioration of China's human rights situation affects the world, um, is that um, I very much agree that uh, under Xi Jinping, uh, the Chinese party state has uh, expressed um, uh, much more clearly than before its, its global governance ambitions. And certainly we can see um, that play out um, uh, in institutional context, for instance, looking at the UN, the various attempts to um, manipulate, to influence um, uh, the uh, institutions, for instance, the human rights bodies of the United Nations uh, to manipulate the Human Rights Council. Um, are certainly important um, developments um, and uh, and as are the various long arm tactics that um, uh, have also been um, hinted at um, uh, in the context of extradition and so on. What I think um, is important from my perspective as someone who's very interested in how international human rights law is developing more broadly is that unfortunately this has coincided with a withdrawal of support from international human rights law and its institutions by other countries and i would want to argue i would to want to throw out the argument that um, uh, we are seeing a deterioration a weakening of international human rights law partly because of autocratic pressure but partly also because of uh, populist pressure or populist withdrawals of support from these international institutions. Um, so there's a kind of synergy, an unfortunate synergy, I think, between 
the development of autocracy and um, what is happening under some populist governments in liberal democracies. Um, so, so what is the answer to that? I mean, I think that um, it is very important to try and defend, to try and, um, and strengthen the integrity of uh, those institutions that, for instance, in the context of uh, Xinjiang, um, have uh, shown themselves um, fairly weak uh, uh, in, in recent times. Um, uh, and in that context, I think it is important to see that, um, yes, it was shocking and um, uh, disgraceful that uh, it uh, took so long for the uh, High Commissioner um, on Human Rights uh, to issue their report, but um, they uh, let themselves uh, be instrumentalized uh, by um, the Chinese party state on the occasion of their visit um, to China. But still, it is important that the report has come out and we can see that um, it has some effects uh, because it gives a, a kind of authority to what it recognizes um, to have happened. And of course, that is um, not only true of um, the um, uh, crimes against humanity, the human rights violations in Xinjiang, but also regarding other regions. I will stop here with many thanks. Thank you so much, Eva, for um, highlighting and explaining very explicitly about the exacerbation of uh, human rights violations in China uh, after Xi Jinping came into power, and also about um, how China affects uh, not just uh, the people in China, but also the world. Uh, thank you so much. And now I would like to table a question for all the speakers to address. So uh, please do let me know who wants to go first. Uh, the, uh, the question is, um, as we look ahead to the 20th Party Congress in October, uh, what does the prospect of Xi securing an unprecedented third term uh, mean for the trajectory of human rights in China? What are your thoughts on this issue? Uh, is it all bad news? Or are there any signs that mounting domestic challenges inside China could result in meaningful change to the CCP's treatment of uh, religious and ethnic minorities? Well, let me quickly say this. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, I think um, if uh, Xi Jinping's third term is not guaranteed, then October 16 will not be announced as the day of the Congress. So I think, you know, his third term, um, I think is almost certain. Um, but then yes, uh, what will happen after his secure third term, I think it's unprecedented. We are entering an uncharted territory where he's becoming, you know, uh, trying to become an equal to Mao Zedong, uh, not just Deng Xiaoping and Cheng Zemin and others. Um, uh, then within China, uh, I think, you know, uh, uh, he will be answerable. But unfortunately, in the last 10 years, uh, what we have witnessed in Tibet and Hong Kong and East Turkestan, I think human rights violations will continue. It will tend to be more repressive. I'm sure you all have um, read uh, at least uh, the report Human Rights Watch uh, that uh, Chinese government is collecting DNA uh, of Tibetans so that they can have surveillance and control over people not just they have a manual surveillance of all the spies in, in the neighborhood uh, of Tibetan villages and towns, not enough. Not only they have electronic surveillance, not enough. Artificial intelligence and algorithm manipulate surveillance, not enough. Now, DNA has been collected, right? So that kind of surveillance means no repression to uh, not just Tibetans, but Chinese people in general. So hence, we all have to come together. Anyone wants to add to that? Yeah, I, I uh, say a couple of uh, sentences. You know, is Xi Jinping uh, is one of the most uh, autocratic dictator of fascist. We can say everything. This uh, the leader of the uh, Chinese uh, history and uh, particularly Chinese Communist Party. All leader of the Chinese Communist Party is the same, same measure, same, same way, and. Uh, uh, follow up the Mao Zedong's way. Uh, so uh, Xi Jinping, uh, uh, you know, came to the power in 2014. Uh, 
uh, his uh, is the Chinese government, Chinese Communist Party policy towards the Uyghur, Tibet, Hong Kong, uh, and the, and the, and the, is it, so the Mongolia is all the time is assimilation, discrimination policy has never changed. But Xi Jinping turns this policy to the genocidal policy. Okay, we have seen, you know, more than three million people in, I say, in Turkestan and the in concentration camp, sexual abuse and the, the indoctrinate a separate family, millions of children. This happens in Xi Jinping time. However, he will, he will be elected or not. Actually, this is not matter. All Chinese Communist Party leaders, because the problem is Chinese Communist Party. So if it, maybe some others leaders coming after Xi Jinping, maybe a little bit change something, but main purpose of the Chinese Communist Party will never change. I, I strongly believe that because we had a bad experiences since, since, since more than 70 years. So that's why most important thing is, is Chinese Communist Party is a problem. Yeah, this is the, my view. Finn, you want to add? Yeah, I totally agree that, uh, well, the Chinese Communist Party would never change. The only way that we could free Tibet, we, uh, East Turkestan and Hong Kong is to, uh, to lead the collapse of the CCP. And in terms of the Hong Kong contest, well, uh, Xi Jinping came to power since 2013. And in 2014, we got the umbrella movement. It is so peaceful and we got a, hundreds of thousands of people marching on the street, occupying the street of Hong Kong to protest against the Chinese Communist Party and fight for universal suffrage. And then in 2016, we got a large scale of uh, disqualification of uh, parliamentarians in Hong Kong. Uh, this is the first time in Hong Kong history ever. And then in 2019, you can see that, well, we got millions of Hong Kongers marching in the street against the extradition bill. So that is the, um, well, the situation under the rule of Xi Jinping. So that's why when he could get uh, his first term. Of course, the situation in Hong Kong would get uh, deteriorated. And right now we are going through some sorts of, uh, I would say maybe the same fate of those people in East Turkestan and Tibet, because well, uh, they're trying to eradicate our um, mother language, Cantonese. They are trying to eradicate our history, our culture and everything in our uh, homeland. And there are some ideas proposed by some uh, government officials saying that, well, we should consider education camp, we should try to de-regularize uh, those Hong Kong people. So that is what's going on in Hong Kong. So I would say that in, uh, in the short term, the situation in Hong Kong is going to be very bad. On the other hand, we must not forget Taiwan. And I believe when Xi Jinping came uh, come to power again, uh, got, get his first term, then Taiwan must be his next target. After all, this is his political ambition. Uh, this is the political ambition of Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party. They will try to unite, so-called un, uh, unite uh, with the Taiwanese people. So that's why we must keep an eye on the upcoming uh, ceremony. Yeah. Eva? I would just very quickly add that um, I agree that, um, of course, the fundamental um, problem with human rights in China is um, uh, the institutional structure, the legal political system. Uh, grounded in Leninist ideas, um, uh, further uh, uh, very much uh, developed uh, recently. Um, it's those structures that are a fundamental obstacle. Um, but I do think that um, there has been a deterioration under Xi Jinping that uh, would now make it especially difficult to sort of reverse direction to um, even engage in sort of uh, more limited uh, human rights based reforms or sort of uh, the kind of timid liberalization of the legal system that uh, was taking place previously. And that, of course, is especially concerning. I would um, personally be very uh, doubtful of the chances of changing China, as it were, from without. Um, I think that ultimately um, change can only um, come from within a Chinese society that is at the moment, especially under pressure because its civil society elements have been so much persecuted and so much um, repressed. 
Uh, thank you so much, all our speakers. And moving on to our second question, uh, the Office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights released its long-awaited report of human rights concerns in um, East Turkestan or the Uyghur region. Uh, the report states that China's persecution of Uyghurs and other predominantly uh, Muslim groups may constitute international crimes, in particular crimes against humanity. So what are your thoughts on the overall aspect assessment and recommendations in the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights Report, and how would you like to see uh, Michelle Bachelet's successor, uh, the office itself, um, and the international community follow up on the report? Uh, maybe, Dolkin, you want to go with this? Dolkin? Yeah, thank, you for the, uh, thank you for the question. Yeah, it's a very long uh, what it, uh, is the report is published just you know, as you said at the beginning of being just uh, 30 minutes before uh, her team is uh, determined and she published. We know uh, since the money because this report uh, finalized last year September actually, you know, one year delay exists because of the Chinese pressure one side on the we have witness also. Uh, last June section, 47 uh, member states may uh, jo uh, sign jointly statement asking the bachelor should to be released the report as soon as possible. But China mobilized another 60 country and they make a strong pressure to, to the uh, uh, bachelor that don't uh, issues block the report. You know, just do. But however, last minute uh, uh, she uh, released this. This is good step, but this. Uh, this report, this is all evidence, is not new for us. Uh, for us, for from all prospects, this is uh, uh, report is not good enough for us because today, as I uh, mentioned my my statement, U.S. government plus ten national parliament and European parliament plus European parliament recognize Uyghur genocide motion, and the uh, Uyghur tribunal within eighteen months. Study collected 100,000 page document and more than 500 people's testimony. Then, uh, I make mean, judge this is a uh, non political, this is an independent people's tribunal and judgment is genocide and crimes against the humanity. But uh, High Commissioner report saying is the uh, crime against the humanity. So, this is uh, it's a far from all, uh, all willingness or all, all recuse, but however, it is very significant. Because so far, quite a lot of country was silence, uh, silence, and then it, because oh no, no, no voice from the waiting from the UN High, High Commissioner's report. So no, this report opens a, a way to a member state and UN mechanism to shoot the concrete action. So there is no excuse anymore. We will see. At this yesterday, uh, 25 uh, 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 the special reporter expert and the call to the uh, uh, General Assembly and the Human Rights Council to act. This is the very significant. So we will see in the next week, next Monday, 51 section of the Human Rights Council will be starting. So we expected, so this genocide was taking place more than six years, but not single origin section was taking place of the Human Rights Council. You know, not single uh, resolution was uh, approved by the General Assembly. So that's why it is the time uh, General Assembly should be appointed and special report or, or any uh, mechanism and mandated to investigate. And also, uh, urgent section should be taking place upcoming Human Rights Council. And also, uh, world uh, labor organization, because first level it is the one of the important key uh, today, but this report not very uh, strong, use, use the language not strong for this. But first level is taking place 21st century today. So many companies, more than 650 international companies, international brands still live with the first level today. So it must be stopped. This is not uh, correct time business as usual. And this is this is the international organization, business uh, uh, institution should be take action. And another issue, no, is quite a lot of Uyghur refugees crisis. You know, uh, 54 Uyghur uh, refugees uh, staying in the Thailand since eight eight years. You know, so uh, so far uh, more than 800 Uyghur refugees in the uh, two decades uh, deported to China. So 
should be UNHCR, United Nations High Commissioner Refugees should be creating some mechanism to protect this Uyghur uh, refugees issue. This is the, my uh, view of this. Thank you. Um, uh, Thank you, Dr. I... Um, yes, uh, Dr. Lufsan Singelai. Um, if I may, you know, um, as I said, uh, the human rights violations uh, of Tibetans and Chinese and Hong Kongers, Uyghurs are not alone, you know. It is a challenge to the rest of the world. So that's why the Human Rights uh, Commissioner could not release the report, you know, till she was about to leave her office, you know, just before midnight, shows how much of pressure and the influence the Chinese government has, you know, on the United Nations. For example, everybody knows there's gross human rights violation going on. Crime against humanity is going on in Uyghur area. But 40 plus countries issue a statement. More than that, almost double the countries, you know, supported the Chinese version, Chinese government version saying it's wrong. So unless the whole world engages collectively, internationally, and in the United Nations, you know, to counter Chinese influence, to speak the truth, Otherwise, United Nations might become ineffective and useless for the victims of human rights, right? Um, I met uh, Michelle Bachelet and I was uh, with my daughter actually at the United Nations. I happened to meet her and then she seems to be a very nice person. And when I talked to her, you know, I was told that for three years, you know, she, she could not meet or avoid it, uh, Tibetan delegations. When I met her, she seemed to be a very nice person. And then she said, by the way, I went to uh, Uyghur area and we are coming up with the report. And she said, she requested the Chinese government that she or her office or the next high commissioner be allowed to visit Tibet. So she has formally requested the next high commissioner to visit Tibet. Now it is a challenge for the rest of the whole, the rest of the world to persuade you know, China and the United Nations so that the Human Rights Commissioner could, could go to Hong Kong, could go to you know, Tibet, to, to go to uh, Mongolian areas and report what is going on. So, you know, otherwise, you know, uh, for example, as far as Tibetans are concerned, one resolution was passed by UN Subcommission in 1990. And after that, we could not pass a resolution about human rights violation in Tibet or China anywhere. Denmark tried in 1993 or 94, they were punished right? Economic sanctions were imposed. When we raised this issue that this is happening, rest of the world avoided us, ignored us. Then they put pressure on uh, Norway after, you know, Lushaba was granted Nobel uh, Peace Prize. When we raised the issue, rest of the world was av avoiding us. And when Australian government raised about the origin of COVID, sanctions and isolation on Australia was put, then, as I said, the members of parliament are now all from all over the world are banned from entering into China. So what happens will happen to the rest of the world. So this is a global challenge that we all must come together. You know, so yes, UN High Commissioner has come out with a report, but next time they should release the report way ahead of time. Not just few, you know, few minutes before uh, you know Human Rights Commissioner uh, leaves our office. So that's the challenge for all of us. So um, um, just you. a quick, uh, sorry, yeah, sure. Just okay. a few yeah. quick words, yeah. Because mm -hmm. I, I think, well, um, other people have got a very excellent and comprehensive uh, political points or regarding the uh, the UN report on Uyghurs. Well, uh, on the other hand, well, there is a concept called ESG, environmental, social, and governance uh, uh, concept uh, in the commercial world. So I would say that with the release of the UN report on Uyghur situation, well. The UN indirectly uh, admitted that well, China is committing some sort of crime against humanity. So, in under that context, so I would say that uh, many business and companies there will be no longer any excuses for them to use uh, forced labor uh, coming from Uyghurs, from uh, coming from East Turkestan. Uh, I would say for those companies who uh, wish to pursue the ESG principle, they must drop the use of. Uh, raw materials, labor from the East Turkestan region. So that is the significant impact on the commercial world. On the other hand, well, uh, I would say that I agree that there must be some uh, other uh, mission or, or observation trip to, uh, to Tibet and Hong Kong as well after this trip. So I hope that the next uh, successor, uh, he or she could do much more uh, in many parts of China. 
Eva? Maybe mm -hmm. uh, just a very quick point um, about um, the discussion about the UN and, and um, its work on human rights and uh, the many ways in which it is being um, uh, threatened and undermined and, and manipulated. I think that, I mean, these points, of course, are incredibly important and it is very important to um, address the potential for manipulation. It shouldn't be the case, in my view, that um, uh, it is possible to um, have membership of the UN Human Rights Council while at the same time, for instance, um, systematically and consistently um, refusing or um, uh, drastically um, limiting opportunities to um, for um, uh, rapporteurs and um, the High Commissioner to visit um, uh, 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 to visit one's own country. I also think that um, it is important to recognize that um, uh, to the extent that um, uh, these uh, UN uh, human rights mechanisms continue to function, their functioning is enormously dependent on transnational civil society, which um, for many years uh, produced excellent reports, um, which exposed uh, these crimes and, and human rights violations um, so consistently and so persuasively that uh, it did eventually, I think, become impossible for the um, uh, UN to sort of um, uh, continue to um, essentially uh, avoid the topic. And I think that's very, very important. Uh, third point, very quickly, um, because uh, several, uh, we raised the issue of potential complicity with human rights violations. And I think that it is very, very important to see that um, there are different actors in liberal democracies, including businesses, including to some extent civil society and um, academia that can in different ways be potentially become complicit with uh, the, the wrongs of autocracy by engaging without um, respecting their human rights responsibilities. And I think that when we think about, for instance, the problem of forced labor, it is uh, very important that we strengthen legislation uh, that really compels businesses um, to conduct proper due diligence, to be transparent uh, about um, uh, their sources and um, uh, ultimately um, to avoid becoming uh, uh, implicated in forced labor by importing goods made with forced labor. These are things that we can do and uh, I think they can be done with much greater consistency uh, than they, they are so far. And similarly, I think that um, we can strengthen the ability of, um, for instance, academic institutions to um, uh, continue engaging with uh, auto partners in autocracies, but without being instrumentalized by them. And uh, that there are many sort of more specific initiatives that uh, we can still take to counter this autocratic pressure that comes from China, but of course also other autocracies in the world. Uh, thank you so much, all our speakers. Uh, now I'll move on to the individual questions and I'll start with Eva. Um, so Eva, Europe has traditionally kept uh, human rights separate from commercial and other interests uh, in relations, um, in its relations with the PRC. The hope has always been that trade and foreign capital will uh, transform China into a more open and democratic society. But uh, then we can see that under Xi Jinping, such hopes have been dashed because um, uh, we can see that China's behavior has become increasingly more assertive and coercive. So how can Europe embed human, human rights in its China policy? And what can the European Union take to advance human rights in China? Yeah, well, thank you very much. I mean, I think it's true, and, and we to some extent already discussed the fact that um, um, for uh, perhaps too long, there was a sort of broad expectation, a very convenient expectation on the part of liberal democracies, including the European Union, its member states, um, 
that uh, somehow China would gradually um, incrementally evolve into a more benign system. And um, under Xi Jinping, that has been um, sort of proved to be untenable as an assumption um, to, to work with. Um, I think that has profound implications for how, um, for instance, the European Union and its member states uh, engage with China um, uh, some of the approaches that are sort of based on the idea of cooperation, collaboration and dialogue, I think, um, uh, are sort of uh, increasingly have increasingly become discredited. And um, uh, the uh, EU, its member states, I think, must revise um, uh, its approach, uh, for instance, to the uh, issue of dialogue. And then, as I just mentioned, I think that um, there are um, numerous things that uh, need to be done when it comes to um, international uh, governance mechanisms. I think that um, uh, there should be support uh, now that uh, the uh, uh, the OHCH, uh, OHCH, 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 the uh, report of the Office of the High Commissioner um, for Human Rights is out. There should be support um, for a special mandate, uh, uh, a special UN-based mandate uh, to follow up on uh, the report um, and uh, sort of keep um, holding China to account for its human rights violations. Um, I think also that um, existing initiatives, for instance, to uh, strengthen the human rights uh, responsibilities um, of business enterprises in the context of forced labor, I think that uh, these initiatives can be strengthened by sort of giving teeth uh, to the obligations that business enterprises have not to impose goods made, made with forced labor. So I think that there's a, a number of um, uh, responsibilities that liberal democracies that uh, European countries have. And of course, as was mentioned earlier, um, uh, it is extremely important also to provide support to um, communities um, of uh, in diaspora, to refugees, to recognize our obligation uh, not to send people back into situations of, of extreme, of very, very grave risk. Um, so um, I think that there are plenty of um, areas where um, liberal democracies um, can uh, honor their human rights obligations um, uh, much more than, than they are doing at the moment. Thank you, Eva. And, I, and we also really hope that there is going to be a positive uh, change after the report. Uh, so my next question is for Dolkin. Uh, Dolkin, you recently published your memoir titled The China Freedom Trap, uh, which talks about the story of a Uyghur fighting Chinese hegemony. So what is the core message um, of your memoir? And why do you think that storytelling is an important part in um, of the Uyghur people's narrative? Well, thank you. Yes, as you said uh, recently, just two, three weeks ago, uh, my uh, book is China Freedom Trap is uh, published. This is mostly my uh, personal experience uh, for more than uh, two decades when, uh, when I was uh, in the exile. This is most of them the story and the uh, uh, challenge was happening in the free world, in, and not in Uzbekistan, not in China, not some other uh, dictator's regime. This is all the happening in the free world. I'm the German citizen, uh, I'm the European citizen, but the, besides of this uh, advantage, I had been faced a lot of uh, problem uh, by the free world. I, I have been detained in several country border, more than 10 or 15 country border. I was detained and sometimes I had faced to deport to China. Uh, even I uh, I was uh, detained in the United States, you know, in 2006 when, when I arrived, but now it's the problem is not uh, anymore. I got a human rights prize, a democracy prize as a capital hill, but before I got this level, I got a lot of problem. Uh, I studied Turkey, but today I cannot enter. And India denied my electronic visa. I detained South Korea for four nights. Yeah, this is on even in the middle of Europe, in the Italy, 2017, I was detained in the Italy, you know, because of the Chinese pressure. So this is the old uh, experience history of the man I had faced by the democratic and the free world. It does mean Chinese law I'm getting everywhere, everywhere. So today I would like to tell this book 
you know, China not only Sweden, not only persecution of Uyghur, Tibetan, and the and of the Mongolia in China is its, its territory, but China's long arm not getting to the, uh, on the uh, uh, free world as well. I was also from the United Nations, and uh, my expedition was cancelled. It is the happening in the in the in the in New York. So I told all the story, and China used all international mechanism. China trying to economic power, it is diplomatic power, trying to monopolize the international system. UN human rights system, we are already talking about a little bit, and uh, 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 trying to block the uh, UN report as well. And then also Chinese government use, misuse the Interpol, uh, Interpol, World Health Organization, many, 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 many examples. Uh, so China misuse all international uh, mechanism, trying to block this Uyghur activism, Tibet activism, Hong Kong and the Taiwanese activism. This is all happening in the free world. So I would like to, uh, uh, from this book, I will tell the world, look, China not only threatened to the Uyghur, Tibet, Hong Kong, it's it, 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 territory, and China today is in the threatened and the global democracy, global human rights, global peace. So that's why the whole world should be wake up. It is a time to wake up and the world should be, particularly democratic nations should be uh, getting united, getting one voice. Unfortunately, sometimes we have seen democratic voice not getting together, it's split. But authoritarian regime, dictator regime led by China getting the one voice, one voice. So that's why if no China is second economic on, on, on the world, if continuous silence and maybe 20 years later, China being first economy, then what kind of world we are li uh, living? So world people should be uh, thinking twice. This this book, I would like to give this message to the world. How dangerous the Chinese Communist Party. Thank you so much, Dolkun, and I totally agree with you. And it's an unfortunate fact that uh, China's influence is not just for the people who are um, under the occupied uh, na occupied regions under China, but also uh, to the free uh, free world. So um, yeah, so we'll move on to the next uh, next question. Uh, this for Dr. Lopsang Singila. And uh, what uh, what are the prospects uh, for the resumption of dialogue uh, between the Chinese government and the representatives of uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama? Uh, the CCP policy and approach appears to be uh, one of waiting out the current Dalai Lama. So what are the scenarios you see unfolding with such an approach? And how can the European Union and other governments help? Dr. Lopsang Singila, you are on mute. Um, first, I want to congratulate my good friend Dokum Isa for his book, China Freedom Trap. He was so busy with me traveling all over the world, but I don't know how he got it, got the time to write his book. You know, secretly he never told me uh, that he was writing. I recommend uh, uh, our friends in India to read the book. This book is published at the moment in India, so it will be available around the world later. Um, and then I would also like to acknowledge uh, Sakina, but she was a very popular anchor on uh, Tibet television, you know, when I was Sikyong, and uh, she's also a Hassa Muslim. So, you know, uh, uh, we have a cultural diversity uh, 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 in the Tibetan community as per the vision and blessings of His Holiness the Lama. Now, as far as dialogue is concerned, or human rights in China in general is concerned, I think we must understand, I, I wrote this paper a long time back in 2004 or five. For Communist Party of China, party is paramount. And number two, unity is paramount, right? So unity against diversity, right? Um, and, you know, when they talk about minority rights or a quote unquote autonomy, um, autonomy space will only be there as long as it doesn't challenge unity. Now, but then the Chinese government, the party is so um, paranoid uh, that any time, you know, small space for autonomy is given or rights is given, unity will come and don't give any space for that. Uh, in that context, if you look at the Chinese government, they took over Tibet, they, uh, they are repressing people in the, uh, our good brothers and sisters, 
and they're taking over, they took over Hong Kong and represent Tibet, uh, the Hong Kongers in Hong Kong. Now they want to, I mean, it's their goal, uh, announce the goal to take over Hong Kong. So in this drive, they want to take over rather than give anything, right? So in that context, you know, yes, we are for middle way approach. We believe in that, we subscribe to that. This is a great vision of a solemnist Dalai Lama and policy of CTA, and I subscribe to that, right? But at the moment, the trajectory that uh, Xi Jinping and the Communist Party is going, they are more for controlling, more in emphasizing unity than give autonomy. So um, uh, we should always remain hopeful, but in immediate, um, uh, what do you call time, um, I think they are more focused on further controlling Hong Kong and trying to take over uh, Taiwan than giving any autonomy or dialogue to Uyghur people or you know, Tibetan brothers, sisters, or Mongolian. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Lubsang Singila. And uh, also thank you for um, being so kind with your words as always. And uh, Dolkyun, um, congratulations for your book. And I also really uh, look forward to reading your book someday. Thank you. Uh, so my next question is for um, Finn. So uh, Finn, Uh, Finn, can you can you tell us what are the next steps for Hong Kong in the fight for democracy and civil liberties? Are you optimistic about the future of Hong Kong? And uh, what can the US, EU and other governments do to help? Well, um, I would never describe myself uh, as the so-called uh, activist in exile forever. I'm not in exile permanently. Well, yes, in short term or mid term, then I'm in exile. But in long term, I believe I must be able to go back to Hong Kong without any fear, without any liabilities of being persecuted or imprisoned. The reason why I'm quite optimistic among uh, the Hong Kong activists is that, well, uh, after 2019, I see hope because, well, between 2016 and 2019, I was quite pessimistic regarding uh, the future of Hong Kong. The reason why is that, well, uh, Hong Kong, well, we, at that time, Hong Kong seemed not uh, quite aware of the threat uh, from the Chinese Communist Party. We were not uh, aware of the, uh, of the threat that uh, they are trying to reform our education system such that we, they could eradicate our Hong Kong identity. To me, I would say that without Hong Kong identity, Hong Kongers are nothing. That's why we must keep our identity. And to keep our identity, we must preserve our culture, our history, and our language. So right now, of course, well, uh, in 2019, after 2019, we got the Draculian National Security Law in place in Hong Kong. However, Hong Kong, we right now, we got the determination to preserve our identity. In Hong Kong, we got uh, a trend that uh, we will try to rediscover the history of Hong Kong. We will talk about how to preserve our history. We will try to have some private group to try to preserve our Cantonese. We will have uh, other means that could uh, try, we try to bypass the so-called censorship in uh, all the aspects, such as to preserve our identity. So that is what's going on in Hong Kong, despite uh, all the uh, all the bans on uh, assembly, all the bans uh, on uh, on press freedom and, and so on. On the other hand, for those uh, diaspora Hong Kong people overseas, we are trying so hard, we are fighting so hard to voice out for our local Hong Kongers, for our friends inside Hong Kong. We try to advocate different policies against the Chinese Communist Party alongside different allies like the Uyghurs and, uh, and Tibetan. So that it was uh, people outside Hong Kong are trying so hard to do so. Of course, for those overseas people, overseas Hong Kong people, we are also trying to preserve our culture as well. That's why I would say that I see hope in that aspect. On the other hand, I would say that it's just a matter of time that, well, the Beijing regime or Xi Jinping uh, would invade Taiwan. And Taiwan will be the fate uh, or the key to the fate of uh, uh, Hong Kong, East Turkestan and Tibet. The reason why is that, well, if Taiwan could successfully defend themselves from the invasion, just like Ukraine, then mm -hmm. I would say that it's just a matter of time that uh, the Beijing regime would collapse, or at least partially, if not totally. History told us that, well, 30 to 40 years ago, if you said, uh, the, uh, I believe in the collapse of the USSR, other people must say, well, you are dreaming. But in the end, we know the history. Because the world, including the US, UK, European countries, and the rest of the world, we uh, jointly adopt the correct strategy to sanction, to drain the financial resources of Soviet Union. And then in the end, with the fight 
coming uh, with the fighting spirit uh, of the local people in Eastern European countries, in the end, the Soviet Union collapsed suddenly. So I believe that's why uh, East Turkestan, Tibet and Hong Kong would be free just like the Baltic state someday. It may be 10 years later on, it may be 15 years later on, but that will be happening suddenly. So yeah, so let's hope for that situation to come. Thank you so much, Fen, and uh, thank you so much for explicitly explaining to us about the importance of preserving our history um, in terms of um, keeping it alive as Chinese government. They are trying to do everything in their capacity to eliminate all of that. And we Tibetans are also doing the same in exile, at least. Um, so uh, thank you so much, Fen, and uh, thank you to all our speakers. Uh, so I'm going to end um, the uh, the discussion here. And, uh, and before I um, make an ending statement, I would like to um, uh, tell our viewers that if you all have uh, joined the discussion late, uh, then uh, you can uh, you can log on to AFI's uh, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube and watch the entire panel discussion there. So thank you, everyone. And I must say that uh, discussions like this serves an important purpose of keeping the discourse going. It may not solve the problem, but it will definitely uh, help in keeping the issue alive. Because today we have speakers from across the spectrum. Uh, we are heading towards a stronger alliance building. And China is not just for us but it is for the world to watch. On a personal note, it has been an incredible experience and I would like to thank AFI for making me a part of its team. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. <laughs> Okay, so I, I have to drive to the Munich now <laughs> from Prague. Okay, safe drive. Welcome. Yes. <laughs> Hope your book will sell well. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And then, then you treat me dinner. <laughs>